Hi, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Saeed Malami and I'm the student coordinator for the Mill series. Tonight we welcome Coleman Hughes. Coleman is a student of philosophy at Columbia University who has, since mid-2018, become an emerging critical voice in race matters in the United States when his first article for Quillette was published. Since then, he has written a great deal more for Quillette and has been featured on several podcasts like Sam Harris's show and The Rubin Report. Tonight, he will be speaking on um, race in America. Please join me in welcoming Coleman Hughes. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's, real, it's an honor to be here at Lafayette for the Mill series. Uh, I have to apologize in advance. I, uh, I have a cold. I woke up yesterday with an itch in my throat that has since blossomed into a full-blown experience. So if I seem low energy, it's not you, it's me, okay? <laughs> so uh, when Russia waged its social media campaign to destabilize American politics in 2016, they targeted one demographic group more than any other. It could have been Democrats or Republicans. It wasn't, wasn't Antifa, wasn't the alt-right, it wasn't Christians, it wasn't Muslims. It was black people. Now, I think this is no accident. I think race is arguably America's most divisive issue, and I think our foreign enemies know that. But I doubt I need to persuade you that the American public is divided on race. You need only turn on the news, or more likely, check social media to see the latest scandal. Last week, it was Jesse Smollett's fabricated hate crime. A week before, it was Governor Ralph Northam's yearbook photo depicting one man in blackface and another in a KKK costume. A few weeks earlier, it was the weatherman who got tongue-tied on air and seemed to utter a racial slur. Uh, sometimes the scandals uh, are longer. They last months or years, as with the case of the Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter uh, debacle. Either way, the pattern is the same. Some event with, with racial overtones occurs. One half of the politi political spectrum, and it varies, uh, has a meltdown, and the other half has an equal and opposite meltdown. Uh, both sides think each other are completely crazy. Um, but I I'm not going to discuss these specific scandals today. Uh, instead, I'm going to present what I believe is the fundamental disagreement that's playing itself out in our culture over and over again in microcosm. At bottom, I think we're experiencing a clash between two visions, two different ways of orienting yourself philosophically towards the issue of race. And I should note here that I I'm drawing heavily on the work of a critical race theorist named Gary Peller, who I have a lot of disagreements with, but who is, who is been more useful than anyone I know in drawing the, the distinction between these two visions. The verse, first vision is what I call the humanist vision. This is the vision held by Martin Luther King, Bayard Rustin, A. Philip Randolph, and other civil rights leaders. And it's advocated today by writers like Thomas Sowell, John McWhorter, Glenn Lowry, Adolph Reed, and many more. The central claim of the humanist vision is that racism <coughs> primarily should be understood as the opposite of reason. Attributing meaning to the amount of melanin in someone's skin is a kind of logical error in this, in this vision. Uh, therefore, it's equally irrational to hate all black people, to hate all white people, or all Asians. These are all seen as variations of the same mistake. Right? To be prejudiced against anyone because of their color is to have an irrational belief. And to discriminate against a, a person for that reason is to act out your own irrationality. So that's the first vision. The second vision is what I call the anti-racist vision. This was the vision held by Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, and the Black Power Movement. And it's the vision articulated today by <coughs> ta Coates, Ibram Kendi, Nicole Hannah-Jones, and many others. The fundamental principle of the anti-racist vision is that the meaning of racism is based in the historical power relations of a particular society or a particular country. In this vision, your skin color is not meaningless. Rather, it's injected with meaning by history and by the particular history of the society you live in. And because racial power relations in American history have been asymmetrical, it's been almost entirely white suppressing blacks, 
therefore, the meaning of racism today is also asymmetrical, which is to say that a, a black person hating white people is not the same as a white person hating black people, because you can't abstract away from American history and speak of racism as if it had a kind of universal or objective meaning. Um, the best analogy I can think of to capture the difference between these two visions, and it is a fundamental difference, uh, is weight. Before you ever took a physics class, you probably assumed, like most people, that every object has a fixed objective weight in, in, measured in pounds or kilograms uh, that didn't change based on where that object is located in the universe. Then you took intro physics and learned that there's no such thing as the objective weight of an object. It's a meaningless question to ask. Rather, objects only have a weight in virtue of the particular planet they're on and the amount of gravity on that planet. What they do have is an objective mass that doesn't change wherever, right? So that's, that's an analogy. Uh, for the humanist vision, racism is a departure from neutral reason. It's an objective concept like mass. For the anti-racist vision, the meaning of racism is embedded in the history of a particular society, much like an object's weight is grounded in the amount of gravity on a particular planet. <coughs> so uh, <coughs> let me give a concrete example of, uh, example of each vision from famous thinkers in each tradition. <coughs> Martin Luther King said, black supremacy is as dangerous as white supremacy. And God is not interested merely in the freedom of black men and brown men and yellow men. God is interested in the freedom of the whole human race, unquote. Now notice the ethical symmetry here between white racism and black racism. King obviously would never deny that the power of, of white racism had absolutely dwarfed the power of black racism in American society. That goes without saying. But both kinds of racism are equally irrational in, in, the, in, in the sense that they depart from the humanist ethic, right? And now an example from uh, the most famous living thinker in the anti-racist tradition, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates. Now here, Coates is commenting on the ethics of gentrification, the process by which white people enter an all or mostly black neighborhood, change the culture, change the mix of businesses, etc. cetera. Uh, it'll probably come as no surprise that Coates believes gentrification is evil, a manifestation of white supremacy. I think the exact quote is, but a more pleasing name for, for white supremacy. Uh, but I like to I'd like you to pay attention to why he believes this, right? Here, here's what he says, quote, the notion that Washington DC should remain black has always struck me as really bizarre. Very little in America ever stays anything. Change is the nature of things. It only makes sense if you buy that black people are owed something. That is, since we never got anything for slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, blockbusting, segregation, housing, and job discrimination, we at least deserve the stability of neighborhoods and cities we can call home." Unquote. So this is the anti-racist vision in its purest form. Notice the thinking here, right? But for the history of white racism, he argues, it would be crazy to single out black people for special treatment, right? Instead, the rationale for singling us out for special treatment is precisely the fact that we used to get singled out for especially bad treatment. This shows you the degree to which history and, and the contingent history of American society is a central principle of the anti-racist vision. So now that I've um, <coughs> explained the fundamental difference between the two visions, I want to caution against a few misunderstandings. First, the difference between humanist vision and the anti-racist vision ultimately has nothing to do with political left and right or with economics. In the humanist tradition, you have left-wing socialists like Bayard Rustin, who was a communist in his early days, Adolf Reed, another socialist, but you also have free market conservatives like Thomas Sowell. Uh, likewise, in the anti-racist tradition, there are left-wing progressives like Ta-Nehisi Coates and social conservatives like Malcolm X in his early days, or uh, Elijah Muhammad. Uh, secondly, I've been speaking as if there's a perfectly clear boundary between these two visions, such that everyone falls on one side or the other, but as is usually the case, it's, it's not quite that simple. It's less of a binary and more of a spectrum. Uh, but it's still, it's a spectrum with two very powerful centers of gravity. 
uh, in the same way that you can identify black and white on a color wheel without being able to identify the exact row of pixels that separates one from the other, you can identify the, the basic structure of the two visions without being able to place every person uh, into one camp or the other. <coughs> and thirdly, these visions are generally held implicitly rather than explicitly, by which I mean uh, many people hold the humanist vision as a kind of gut feeling, but couldn't really tell you its principles. Likewise, many people hold the anti-racist vision as a kind of gut feeling, but couldn't state its principles, principles explicitly. The assumptions of each vision are almost never articulated in our national race debate. Uh, yet, this doesn't make the visions any less powerful. In fact, just the opposite. It's precisely the fact that the assumptions are never made explicit that makes the vision seem so obvious to those who hold them and, and so obviously wrong to those who don't. So till now, I've been, I've been presenting a kind of neutral analysis of both visions, but I'm going to come out of hiding here and say that I'm a partisan on behalf of the humanist vision. I think the anti-racist vision is a disaster intellectually, politically, and ethically. And uh, unfortunately, it seems to be on the rise. If you doubt that it's on the rise, uh, consider this. <coughs> the, quote, uh, excuse me. the quote from Ta-Nehisi Coates that I gave you earlier, uh, that came from an addendum to his essay, The Case for Reparations. That essay, many of you will, will probably know, was published five years ago. <laughs> And it was a kind of long-form plea for Americans to grapple with the role of slavery, Jim Crow, uh, redlining, uh, in the creation of the racial wealth gap, the staggering racial wealth gap between blacks and whites. His essay really electrified the nation. Uh, it uh, launched him to permanent intellectual stardom and provoked a heated debate amongst critics. But there's one fact that was uni universally agreed upon by Coates, by his critics, uh, by his defenders, and that was uh, none of us expected to see reparations on the platform of a mainstream uh, presidential candidate anytime soon. The thinking was that Coates could afford to make the case for reparations because he's a writer and a truth teller and a gadfly, but a politician trying to win over uh, America's race-shy electorate would be committing, <laughs> committing political suicide uh, if they attempted to do the same thing. Last week, we were all proven wrong, I, I would argue. Uh, Elizabeth Warren just endorsed reparations for slavery. Uh, Kamala Harris said she supports reparations. Uh, but in her case, she seems to have her own private definition of the term, namely any anti-poverty policy. And that's, that's particularly interesting to me, right? Because what Kamala, when pressed, supports is not reparations. It's just policy to help the poor. Um, but she still felt, when, like when confronted, that uh, I'm doing a bit of mind reading here, I'll, I'll acknowledge, but she couldn't just say no to reparations in the way that Bernie Sanders did, for example, um, even though their policies are equally race neutral. My point is this. Five years ago, even Ta-Nehisi Coates' most passionate admirers believed that it would be political suicide for any candidate to endorse reparations for slavery. Now, apparently, we have a mainstream candidate like Kamala Harris who thinks it's political suicide not to endorse reparations for slavery. And all of this, mind you, in a country that, according to Coates, remains fundamentally and essentially white supremacist. Um, e even before the anti-racist vision broke into mainstream politics, uh, it had al already really swept through the culture in ways that don't often get talked about. One rather amazing indicator of this fact, uh, rather amazing to me, is that black first names and white first names have massively diverged uh, in the post-civil rights era. Indeed, precisely the era in which racism has declined. In the late 1960s, the typical black woman living in a segregated neighborhood had a first name that was only twice as common among blacks as among whites. Ten years later, the typical black woman living in a segregated area had a name that was 20 times as common among blacks as among whites. The uh, Harvard economist that discovered this fact attributed the tenfold increase in the uh, rate of name divergence to the influence of the black power movement, 
Stokely Carmichael, Rat Brown, um, Nation of Islam, the sense that black people's true home was Africa, uh, our true religion was Islam, so that Stokely, for example, renamed himself Kwame Ture. And uh, now we, ha we feel as if it's a stereotype at this point, uh, commonly known that if you, if you hear someone's name is Tyrone, you think, oh, this is a black person. That's an authentic black name. Uh, virtually unheard of as of 1960. So this is the power of, of the anti-racist vision. Uh, and it's the power of ideas to permeate a culture whether or not they um, uh, influence politics. And last thing I'll say about that is uh, often, you know, if you read the New York Times or you read really any mainstream newspaper, you will find uh, these audit studies often reported where, you, you know, a black candidate, white candidate sends out a job application with a typically black name, typically white name. W without exception, the black names get a lower rate of response. And uh, this is adduced as a kind of evidence for why we need the anti-racist vision. Uh, although, ironically, that very phenomenon is largely enabled by the legacy of the anti-racist vision. <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, coincident with the rise of the anti-racist vision has been an attack on the humanist vision. And there are two main objections to the humanist vision. Uh, one is that the anti-racist vision is, is necessary because of systemic racism, uh, police violence, mass incarceration, housing discrimination, the racial wealth gap. Uh, how are we going to address this if not a bold kind of anti-racism that seeks to, as Coates once put it, directly redress history, right? And I, I'm going to leave the specifics of that objection for the q and I'm, I'm expecting there will be questions relating to systemic racism, um, perhaps police violence or mass incarceration. So I, I'm going to leave that for the Q&A. Uh, but I will say one thing here, which is that the humanist vision was the vision that got black people civil rights in this country. Really, the best thing you can say about the black power movement, Nation of Islam, is that and, and uh, you know, prominent civil rights leaders like Bayard Rustin acknowledge this, um, is that it, they scared the hell out of white people so thoroughly that it drove more white people into the hands of the humanist vision. Um, they said, essentially, if, if that's what you're offering, if you're offering a kind of uh, violent, militant, separatist ideology, I'll take the nonviolent one. So. Uh, frankly, if the humanist vision was good enough for Dr. King, it's good enough for me. And you can absolutely combat uh, systemic racism. You can absolutely combat police violence. You can absolutely uh, form policy to reduce the number of people that are incarcerated without buying the principles of, of the anti-racist vision. None of that is entailed. It was not entailed for Dr. King, nor, nor is it entailed for us. The second objection um, is that the, the humanist vision is a kind of naive attempt at colorblindness. Um, there's a, the, the idea being that uh, the history of America has not been colorblind. You can't just fire the starting gun now and say, right now we're going to start treating everyone as individuals when you haven't been doing that for centuries. Right? That is no kind of justice. That's the objection, right? And we're seeing this. This is not. This is no longer um, just a, a view that academics uh, throw at each other, right? This is completely seeped into the culture at this point. I could give many examples. Uh, I'll just give one fr from the past month, although there are several just from the past month. Uh, this one was just particularly sharp. Bernie Sanders. Bernie, Sha Bernie Sanders said, "Quote a couple days ago, I think." We have got to look at candidates, you know, not by the color of their skin, not by their sexual orientation or their gender, or not by their age. I mean, I think we have got to try to move toward a non-discriminatory society which looks at people based on their abilities, based on what they stand for. So this is basically a direct, uh, almost plagiarism of Dr. King. A everything Bernie Sanders said there including the fact that you should not vote for a politician based on their race, are explicitly things Dr. King said. For this, he was ridiculed. Uh, Stephen Colbert mockingly said, quote, 
Yes, like Dr. King, I have a dream, a dream where this diverse nation can come together and be led by an old white guy. Um, I, I highly doubt he would have said that if it were Dr. King saying it. But um, the, the point being that at this point, at least on the cultural and political left, it is taboo. It is taboo to quote Dr. King. Um, <coughs> My, my, my response to the colorblindness objection is, you know, the objection goes that because of the asymmetry of history, we can't be colorblind now. But it is in fact our failure to have been colorblind in the past that caused the very historical injustices that now motivate the anti-racist vision to then adopt policies that impose racial double standards and then give new groups reasons to feel grievances, right? It is setting yourself up for a perpetual motion machine of grievance. Um, let me give one example of this. Uh, forget about whites and blacks for a moment and focus on Asians. Um, uh, Japanese people in this country in 13 or 14 different states were not allowed to own property until 1952 when the Supreme Court ruled that they could I'm sure all of you are familiar with the internment camps, over 100,000 Japanese interned. My point is not that uh, Japanese have had it nearly as bad as blacks have it, had, had it in this country. It's not my point. My point is that they ha have had it much, much harder uh, than whites, historically, right? So this is a case where the anti-racist vision, where racism is embedded in history, should be saying, logically, that we should be giving some kind of, if not explicit, then um, implicit kind of reparations for Asians. And although uh, uh, the specific Japanese who were interned, the, the, who were literally interned, they did get reparations in, in I believe, the 1980s. As a group, uh, we do not treat Asian Americans uh, particularly well in this country. Uh, you need only look at affirmative action and the Harvard case. Uh, but we've, it's nothing new. We've known this for years. 2009, the uh, Princeton sociologist Thomas Espenshade found that uh, identical re uh, an, an, an Asian uh, applicant to, to an elite school had to score several hundred points higher, something like 400 SAT points higher than a black student, and uh, some, somewhere in the vicinity of 200 points, one or 200 points higher than, than a white student, right? So relative to whites, Asians are discriminated against. And I'll, I'll never forget a New York Times editorial from several months ago, which described Asian families in New York who, quote, scrimped on essentials like food to pay for test prep, end quote. I'll never forget that quote, because the article was framed in such a way so as to justify a policy of, of discrimination. Um, this is what I mean when I say the attempt to redress history uh, ends up creating more injustices, more racial injustices, that yet call for more, uh, uh, um, more reparations in, in a broad sense of the term. Um, which, which brings me to my central, my central <coughs> problem with the anti-racist vision is that there's, there's just a zero-sum conflict between justice for individuals, for living individuals, flesh and blood, blood humans, and justice for abstract intertemporal groups. There's, there's no way to reconcile those two um, concepts. Uh, the idea that we're seriously entertaining reparations for slavery, which would put money in my pocket and presumably not in the pocket of a poor white family uh, or a poor Asian family, uh, that, that only makes sense if you have this outsized place, this outsized role for the contingent history of the United States in your current ethical system. But ethical principles cannot be they, 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 they can't just be contingent on the, the particular history of a country because we'll never get out of this. So uh, to paraphrase one of my favorite writers, Thomas Sowell, we currently live in a society where babies are born with a set of ready-made grievances against other babies born the same day. Uh, the anti-racist vision, in my view, is a recipe for remaining in this condition. And the humanist vision is the only way out. Thank you.
Okay, so thank you for coming. Um, I was I volunteered to ask a few questions, so I wanted to address your recent article for the Columbia Daily Spectator. Sure. So one, the first thing that caught my eye when it came to that article was the point you made with the, citing the poll that said that I believe it was 51% of black Americans don't 52. feel, 52? Don't feel that racism, what was the exact phrasing there? Um, uh, I think it's 52% 52, 52 of black Americans, according to a 2016 Pew poll, say that uh, racial discrimination has had virtually no effect on their chances of success in life. Mm. And 60% of blacks with no college degrees say the same. Mm. And I guess my, my response to that would be, do you believe that they are right? No, I think it's a, um, well, let me put it this way. I think it's a non sequitur to say because someone, because 60% of a group believes something, therefore it's true. Um, my point there was not to argue, not to make that logical fallacy, but to say that why is it the case that when I read the newspaper, I never hear that point of view articulated? We're talking about 60% of black people without a college degree when polled saying something that I could not think of a single New York Times op ed having argued having argued that claim. That, that's a, it's a massive failure of um, portraying the legitimate diversity of opinion among black Americans. That was the point I was making. Um, if we want to talk about to what degree racism or systemic racism holds, holds black people back, uh, I, I suppose that's a separate question. Mm. And the other thing that stood out to me is, which you did again here, is you set up the division between all black Americans and black Americans without a college degree. So what is, what is the purpose of pointing out that there's a difference between college and non-college? Well, at face value, you would expect black people without college to report more racial discrimination than black people with college. Um, Maybe you wouldn't, but at, at least I would. I, I would expect the lower you go down the socioeconomic ladder, the more likely it is that people report systemic racism being a problem in their lives. That would gel with the intuition that systemic racism is causing such outcomes for low-income people. But without exception, every poll I've seen that aggregates it by socioeconomics or by, um, rather, that disaggregates black people's opinions by socioeconomics or by education level, finds that the more educated, the more wealthy uh, you are, the more likely you are to see racism as a fundamental barrier in your life. Which it could be because the wealthier black people are around more white people. That's one hypothesis. Uh, another hypothesis is that uh, black people in this country get educated into the politics of grievance to a degree. That's, that's another hypothesis. And I don't know how to tell, tell uh, which one is true. Could be that both are true. But that's why I point that out, because it's counterintuitive. So regarding your speech, like the humanist versus anti-racist view, mm -hmm. like, would you say there's a point of, I mean, you, cite, you say you're, you yourself are a humanist. Would you say there's a point at which that view goes too far, like color, color blindness goes too far, so to speak? Well, it goes too far if you are literally pretending not to be able to see color, like a child. <laughs> like you have your hands over your ears or something like that. Um, Howard Schultz, a few days ago, said, quote, I don't see color. Got him a lot of pushback. And again, there are two ways to interpret that statement, w one of which he deserves the pushback because, yes, you do see color, A. Um, B, first of all, literally colorblind people can still pick out black people from white people, right? <laughs> they confuse red and green, but they don't confuse black and white. Right, right. Um, but, you know, I, it, the question is, is he, so, is he so stupid that that's what he meant? <laughs> or, or um, what, is he a CEO of Starbucks, right? He, let's give him a little bit more credit and say that what he meant was, I, had, I aspire not to have color influence the way I treat people. Perfectly defendable claim, right? He should not have said it that way, and frankly, maybe he is that crazy, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna defend the guy. But uh, yeah, colorblindness goes too far if, if, if you lie about whether you can see color. And, um, 
and we should still be able to admit, uh, admit that you know, if, a, if a psychologist put us all in a lab and measured our implicit bias, or our, you know, they would, f for the most part, whether you're black or white, you find some kind of bias. Um, you find some kind of gender bias. One of the creators of the implicit bias test, though, has admitted that it doesn't predict bias in real life. Your prefrontal cortex comes online, for the most part, and um, prevents you from treating people wildly differently. But we, can, we should all acknowledge that we can, we're capable of being prejudiced. Uh, the question is whether that entails a view of ethics, a view of politics, that is fundamentally grounded in redressing history. And I, I don't think it does. Mm. Thank you. So Thank you. would you say there are positions taken by the anti-racist side of the debate that you would side with more than those taken by the humanist side of the debate? Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. No. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I can't think of anything. Uh, it's conceivable. I see. I mean, there are a lot of, um, again, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, the, I can't conceive of myself agreeing with the fundamental principles of, of the anti-racist vision. I can conceive of myself agreeing with, okay, so, I, okay, I'll give you one example. So, if an anti-racist said to me, well, did you read the New York Times last week? Uh, they did a study that found that court stenographers routinely mess up when they're uh, transcribing people who speak black English, black people. Um, and sometimes they mess up so bad that they transcribe it to mean the opposite of what the witness is saying. Um, and that's an example of systemic racism. I would say, yeah, I agree with that. Um, but again, you don't need to be a part of the anti, you, you don't need to hold the anti-racist vision to acknowledge those cases of legitimate systemic racism that exist. Okay, well, thank you. I'm going to turn this seat over to Daniel then. So. meet you. Great to meet you. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk about my favorite subject, which is politics. Okay. And, and the intersection of politics and culture and race, because it seems like race is a heavily politicized topic right now. I mean, you see 95% support among African Americans for Democrats, and you see similar levels of support for people who hold racial animus among Republicans. But you seem to talk about politics less than most thinkers who talk about race. So I'm, I'm just wondering, how, how intentional is that? I'm not a political buff. I find politics uh, largely toxic. I have to follow it because you have to be informed if you're in my profession. And I want to keep tabs on what's happening. But I'm much more concerned in the long run with the power of ideas. I, the reason I gave that example of the divergence in black and white naming patterns is explicitly because an idea can be so powerful that it can move entire cultures without it necessarily having to break into politics. I mean, politics is often, I suppose, downstream would be the way to put it, of, of culture. Not always. Uh, sometimes politics can cause a change in the culture as well. It's a, it's a feedback loop. But that's why, I mean, just, just the fact of having blacks and whites have such different names the consequences of that for division, social division, are not measurable. You can't, you, know, you, you can't put the, um, you can't put a number on on how much unnecessary strife and paranoia and needless division that has caused. But it was a straightforward consequence of just people writing and speaking. That's that's how powerful ideas are. So I, I suppose my reason I don't talk about politics that much is because I'm more concerned about big picture. Okay, yeah, no, but I suppose this this might be unfair in the specific moment, but we live in an all-encompassing political moment. And when I hear what you just said, culture is downstream from politics, is a quote, let's say, is more frequently used in conservative than liberal publications. I think it's a quote directly from a conservative thinker. And so I guess, do you think you can really escape politics in today's world? Because it seems like like I, I've seen when you when you've been on podcasts and you've been interviewed, there's a lot of talk about like the the harassment you receive, and I think 
if you look at Twitter, harassment is an unfortunate existence in the world and on the comments on your YouTube videos as well. But so do you think you can really escape politics in today's world? What's the connection with the harassment? Because it's all political as far as I can tell. Oh. They're saying you are a whatever. It's, it's a political statement. I'm not sure. I mean, uh, are, is it political? I mean, pe people well, say many yes. things about me, but it's usually <laughs> it's, um, my critics at least, uh, usually it's either a, a uh, an epithet of some kind yeah. or it's a criticism of my ideas. Okay, because, um, yeah, I mean, partially... I'm speaking for myself, and I am a political hack, so I acknowledge okay. this. But but I think, but I think it's interesting because what you say ta it brushes up against politics, right? And the sure, intersection sure. between politics and culture is interesting because, like, for example, when you talk about, uh, you, you briefly alluded to the left and the right and the locus mm -hmm. of the sort of you talk about the anti-racist and the humanist movements, and I just. You don't have to answer if this is too political. But to bring it around to politics, you mentioned Bernie Sanders, and mm -hmm. you mentioned the left, and you mentioned the right. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the entire continuum of humanist to anti-racist thought exists within the political left. Because if you look at someone like Barack Obama, he practiced, in my mind, what you describe, what you would describe as humanist politics to the mm -hmm. highest extent possible, right? Um, I wouldn't say that. I would say he's, he's well, one. <laughs> he's like... like uh, Barack Obama would be hard to characterize. It okay. depends what mood he was in. In some moods, he sounded... Well, yeah. He's not some entirely moods, consistent, sure. Like, like many people. Yeah. Um, in some moods, he was very much a humanist, and uh, in a way that I considered quite beautiful. In other moods, uh, not so much. Okay. Uh, James Baldwin is another one that I would say is... You know, in some moods, he said things like... Um, uh, in order to minimize the bill, our children must pay. We must, I'm paraphrasing, insist that the color of the skin is everywhere and always a delusion, right? So that yeah. sounds no, that's, yeah. perfectly humanist, but if you read the totality of his work, he's a very hard, you couldn't just put him in the humanist basket. Okay. That would be cherry picking. Yeah, no, that's um, true. But I, I think it's interesting the way this is talked about on the left and the right, because, and I, I think you have insight on this. It seems to me that the entire debate about using your language, humanist and an, versus anti-racist occurs on the left. I don't see any discussion of this for the most part on the political right. There are some thinkers, you mentioned Thomas Sowell is very much on the right. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the debates within the mainstream of the Republican Party today, right, you see absolutely no discussion of this. And I think this is partially because, well, to be honest, there are very few members of racial minorities on the right right now. So my question is, do you think, it, it seems to me this topic, this whole debate is self-contained on the political left today. Can you really see that this sort of spans the different mm -hmm. political factions in our country right now? Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Um, I, th I think it is, I mean, I think uh, part of what motivates me is, uh, in my view, to save the left from its excesses so that it, pre it, it presents a robust challenge to Mr. Orange Hair. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 Um, <laughs> the other Mr. Arden. It, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question, though. I mean, I, I wonder if, uh, if it was a Democratic incumbent and we had Republicans uh, vying for the nomination, what the conversation would look like. I mean, it's no secret that Trump is, to put it mildly, not the most sophisticated person on race issues. Yeah. He loves the blacks, though. Yeah. That's what they say. <laughs> But yeah, I, I would want, I mean, it, it certainly could be that they're not competing to court black voters for the most part. Uh, that, that could definitely have something to do with it. Do you think Mr. Orange Hair is a racist? <laughs> um, it depends, I mean, I, suppo I suppose it depends what you mean by racist. Fair enough. Racist, I, I find that like communist in the era of McCarthy, it is, the stigma on the word is super pointed and specific, but the definition of the word is mellifluous. Um, um, I mean, it, and they're, they're the, the most racist things that I've heard him allegedly say are alleged. So like the, the, the worker he fired from, from one of his hotels or casinos who, if, if Trump said what the worker said, blacks are lazy, that's what, that's what he alleged. If he said that, that's that's a racist thing to say. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I'm not omniscient. I can't tell if it was just a disgruntled employee. Um, 
I think in the age of Jesse Smollett, we should have a healthy skepticism, not jump to conclusions about whether someone is telling the truth. I think that's the lesson here. Uh, but if it's true, that, that, that's obviously a racist thing to say. Okay. Uh, and then, so to be a little less political, which is very painful for me, but the, <laughs> the next thing I want to talk about is you've talked about sort of the causes of poverty in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. I think you wrote an article on Quillette about it. And I, I think this has been a, a really interesting debate. <coughs> uh, this, I think, has crossed political factions. I think there, there is discussion of this on both sides. But I think it's a really interesting thing because there were quotes in different articles about, like, is the nature of poverty in the African-American community different from poverty, equivalent poverty in the white community? So w what do you think of that issue? Um, I guess I would say two things. One thing is I don't think I've ever talked about the causes of poverty because poverty doesn't really have causes. Wealth has causes. Okay, fair enough, the causes. Um, well, to some extent, poverty is the absence of wealth. Right. Um, and for most of our species history, virtually everyone has been poor. Yeah. Um, the second thing, is black poverty different than white poverty? I think, I think you could have made that argument many decades ago. But now we've seen, for example, the same rise in single parent homes. Um, there's the crack e e epidemic in the black community. Now we're seeing an opioid epidemic in white communities. There's a kind of symmetry. Uh, it's just that the, f in the white community, it happened a few decades later. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I, I, would, I would say fundamentally there, there are no major differences. Yeah, because I, I, I think your reference to opioids is a really important one, because I know a lot of commentators have made the point that what's happening in Appalachia in the sort of the post-industrial Rust Belt areas, the sort of level of despair and poverty and the sort of rapid change from relative affluence to just complete destitution, this level of desperation is similar to what has happened in certain minority communities in that it's not only you have poverty, you have sort of the absence of connection to wealth, right, in the areas around here where all the factories have closed. It, and it's not just that people are poor, it's that they don't know people who are rich, it's mm. that they, the poverty is of a fundamentally different character. Yeah. And there are quite a few targeted government programs that people are talking about for these opioid-stricken areas, right? There's, you know, there's a national emergency declared, there was, there's talk of targeted investment when you talk to the governors of these states, they say we need to revitalize these areas. Mm. And it seems like, obviously, the, the difference between whites afflicted by the opioid epidemic and ones who aren't isn't a racial one. But it seems, it, it seems an interesting point that obviously there are different forms of poverty and there's a sort of different depth to it in these communities. So it seems a reasonable argument to say if targeted policies are needed for poverty of a certain depth and intensity and long, sort of long length, right? Then, then perhaps poverty that is intergenerational, that, that might be linked to these factors of historical oppression, does warrant a differentiated response. Is there a question? Do you think that's valid? Um, that different types of poverty yeah. admit of different kinds of solutions? Yeah. Whew. That's an interesting question. I'm not sure I have an intelligent answer to that. Okay, fair enough, yeah. I'm sort of sort of ranging far afield here. But, but it seems like it's sort of an integral argument to the, uh, sort of in defense of the anti-racist view, which is that if you have certain problems in certain communities that cannot be combated by the tools of traditional social policy, they need some different aspect. And, and anyways, the one last question I would just like to ask <laughs> is once more to the subject of politics. <laughs> when you're talking about uh, the African-American community's support for the Democratic Party. And I have heard you mention this a few times. Mm. You've sort of mentioned how it's tied to the past. And you've mentioned how you've received a lot of backlash uh, from your friends for some, how to put this, less uh, orthodox views that don't align with the left, especially on a college campus. And as we know here, college campuses can be different politically from the rest of the country. And so I guess I'd say, like, do you think there's something sort of uh, about the, within the African community, do you think its political support it, for the Democratic Party is justified? Oh. Um, it's justified. Well, that's a very big question. That's a very big question. I mean, I can think of policies on both ends of the political spectrum that have been good and bad for black people. Um, 
I mean, if I, th I think, for example, minimum wage policy has been a net bad. Uh, minimum wage hikes in the 50s, 60s, 70s for, for the black teenage unemployment rate, which used to be virtually identical to the white teenage employment rate until roughly 1950, and it's, since then it's, uh, it's viewed as a chronic problem that, that uh, black, especially male teens, can't, can't find employment. Um, again, in, in an era where, with far more racism, the teenage unemployment rate was much, uh, much more manageable and I, virtually identical to whites. So I can see I mean, that's one example of a policy that I think Democrats have pushed to, at, at the expense of black people. Um, but I'm, I could come up with examples, I think, where Democrats have done much better than Republicans as well. So um, it's not a, I don't think it's a simple story. To, to weigh the costs and benefits of, of each and say which party has been better for black people in terms of the policy and its consequences, that's, a vi that's, a, that's beyond the scope of my mind right okay. now. Yeah. But one thing I will say is that <coughs> most people don't vote based on policy. They don't, frankly, like, who, who among us has time to really adjudicate based on a cost-benefit analysis the consequences of every policy, right? Like the, the Green New Deal. Who, like, what percentage of people that are for and against it really understand the likeliest consequences at a deep level? <laughs> I, very, very few. Um, it's about how politicians signal it's about Bill Clinton playing the saxophone, and he gets your culture. Um, it's about Obama speaking a little, a little blacker in front of a black audience, and you, it makes you feel like home. Uh, it's about Trump pissing off the people who call you racist all the time and who you like to see squirm. Um, it's, it's largely about that kind of signaling in terms of why black people continue to vote Democrat. The Republican Party does a very, jo a very bad job of signaling to black people uh, culturally, uh, socially, that they were for you. Yeah, because yeah, I've <coughs> noticed that the sort of the, it's, it's shocking because, I mean, Donald Trump is certainly not someone who is known for his racial sensitivity, to say the least. And I think he's a racist, but that's a different issue that we've <coughs> talked about. One of the few things he's done to reach out to the black community is he said constantly, I've done so much for you. Right? He says this a lot. And he sort of makes these like ham handed, uh, appeals, I guess, for want of a better word. He says things like, why are you all voting for the Democrats? What do you have to lose to the African-American community? And so, <laughs> I mean, I guess you sort of answered that, that you don't think there's sort of much validity to that line of attack. I mean, it sounds very sort of blunt, but... Um, um, I mean, well, it, it, in a weird way, at least with the First Step Act, criminal justice reform, basically everything in that act is what Michelle Alexander is calling for with the new Jim Crow, what the left has been calling for. And it just so happens that there was this happy alignment between the left and libertarians. The Koch brothers loved that policy. There was a moment of bipartisanship. Yeah, it, it was really beautiful, and it kind of passed us all by, right? Nobody really yeah, no, there's talked no about it that much. Um, a, because it's kind of painful, I think, for many people to give Trump that win, um, or to admit that he did something potentially good. But uh, I don't. That's apropos of nothing. I don't okay. Know. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. That's fair. All right. And then I guess this is actually my final question. But <laughs> I would just like to ask: when you talk about the humanist versus anti-humanist distinction, or sorry, uh, anti-racist versus humanist distinction, you you mentioned that you don't think it's conscious. Uh, it, it seems like it might become more conscious, like sort of as time goes on, like if this becomes a, a political issue that becomes polarized? Do you think that would be a, like a good thing or a bad thing if this moves from subtext to text? Oh, I think it would be uh, much better if it moved to text because I can't count how many times I've seen two people disagree vehemently on some racial issue. And you know, upon reflection, I, I realize that they have two fundamentally different philosophies as to what racism means, uh, what racial justice would entail. Um, it's not just a semantic disagreement. I mean, if, if I call this a table and you call it a bungalow, 
that's going to be problematic potentially, but you know the the well-being of society does not depend on it. <laughs> Although I'm sure someone creative could come up with a scenario in which it did. But when I have when we're both using the word racism, and we not only have a semantic agreement as to what that concept means, um, but we have an ethical disagreement because because we're talking about two totally different concepts. We have two totally different ethical programs. One is purposed towards redressing history towards a kind of what I would consider to be a more abstract form of justice. And one is purposed towards a kind of justice that is, in my view, within the scope of human power. Right? One is a utopian vision of justice that has consequences for flesh and blood people because utopia never works especially utopia that, utopias that try to balance out the scales of history and leave living people to pay that bill uh, versus a, a vision that says you know, the very reason that we have this impulse to redress history, which is totally an understandable impulse, is precisely because we had these kind of racial double standards in the past. Uh, so we can't then we can't just switch it, then put other living people on the bottom who don't really give a crap that they're paying the bill, they're, they're footing the bill of people who are dead. Um, so yeah, I think if all of that was made text rather than subtext, it would prevent a lot of talking past one another on all of the, these racial scandals that uh, seem to pop up in the news every day at this point. Okay. All right. So keep shouting it loudly and it'll get easier. <laughs> Hopefully. All right. Uh, we do Q&A. <laughs> hey, thank you for your talk. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to hear more about uh, your views on, so let me put it this way. So you said that there's less disagreement between the humanist view and the anti-racist view on the fact that there is systemic racism and racial injustice, et cetera. It's rather their sort of uh, vision towards how to address these issues and how to bring about racial justice. Hmm. Uh, there is something of a disagreement. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the, the concept of systemic racism, initially called institutional racism, came out of the anti-racist vision. It came out of the black power movement uh, <coughs> Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton uh, in 1967 wrote that institutional racism was a kind of more subtle kind of racism. Uh, it wasn't a bigot uh, hanging a, a, a black boy from a tree. It was, it, it still relied on individual bias, but a subtle bias. That was the initial concept of systemic racism. And I gave the example before of uh, the recent news recent study about the criminal justice system and court stenographers, because I think that's a, it's a perfect case of systemic racism um, in the sense that the, the stenographers, black and white, by the way, were basically equally bad at, at transcribing black English. Um, they had this subtle kind of unaware, uh, subtle lack of awareness or lack of capacity to do something that had a you know, systemic effect. It wasn't an anic it wasn't just one person or two people. It was it kind of permeates the system, or it's, it's large enough to to speak in those terms. Uh, so that it, it, it's a concept that is. Um, what I would say about that is that there are very few examples that are that straightforward. What you generally get when people argue that systemic racism is a funda fundamental barrier to black people is you get studies that hold all of these demographic variables constant. Uh, so we're just going to compare 30-year-old black males with two parents to 30-year-old uh, uh, white males with two parents, and we're going to hold everything equal. And if there's some disparate outcome, that's systemic racism. That paradigm is fundamentally misguided because, uh, <coughs> and th this is where you know, Th Thomas Sowell has probably written 15 books, <laughs> uh, but nobody has really listened to him, or very few. Disparity is the norm throughout history. If you just look up on, on Wikipedia, eth uh, uh, s income by household income by ethnic groups, you'll find all kinds of facts. You'll find 
certain in Native American tribes this, right now earn twice as much as certain other Native American tribes. It's not as if the system is twice as bad for one, or history has been twice as bad for one. If you, we haven't even achieved parity within white people. If you look at French Americans, uh, French households that are French American in descent versus Russian American, Russian Americans make a dollar for every 79 cents made by French American households. And you and I could not tell the difference between these people. The point I'm pushing is that disparate outcomes, um, in, in, even in the, uh, disparate outcomes tend to occur even in the absence of systemic racism of any kind. So you can't just look at a gap. You have to really do what they did in the court stenographer study and show the bias itself. Um, so I would say the anti-racist vision in practice tends towards that bad research paradigm. Uh, and the humanist vision, at least you know, I, I'll speak for myself, I'm perfectly happy to acknowledge uh, instances of systemic racism that are proven on, on the bias end, not just the disparate results end. Follow-up question. I, I'm more familiar with how the anti-racist, uh, people who hold the anti-racist vision would address uh, racism. But I think you spoke a little less about how the humanist vision tries to address it. So could you speak just a little about how the humanist side would you know, say that this is how we should uh, address racism and racial issues? What do you mean by address racism? Do you mean uh, <laughs> individual racists? Yeah, or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, political issues concerning racism as well and how we should sure. make the world or America specifically a less racist country. Um, uh, I would say <coughs> I can't speak for the entire humanist vision. I mean, if you know anything about the civil rights movement, which I think you know, most Americans do, you'll see how they addressed racism. All of that is is par for the course in terms of the humanist vision. What I will say is that I'm under no illusion that there will ever be no racism in, uh, in America. Uh, I think we can't mark progress by the complete elimination of racism. I think that's extremely naive. Um, let me, let me, it, it's interesting that we never have these intuitions for something like murder, right? Who, who honestly expects there to be no murder? Who? No, no one. There's never been a society with no murder. You cannot be everywhere at all times. You cannot, um, <clears throat> you cannot cure the hearts of everyone. And we should not try to, because it's impossible. Uh, but yet we can make a lot of progress, and we have made a lot of progress. Just like with murder, you know, the murder rate in New York used to be nine times higher than it is today um, in, the, in the early 90s. Now it's like two or 300 people get killed a year. In, in New York. It used to be two or three thousand in, in recent history. Huge progress. We're never going to get that number to zero. Uh, that doesn't mean that New York is a systemically murderous city. It doesn't mean that there is a murder epidemic. Uh, it is, in fact, a very safe city. So we have to take that approach with racist incidents. In a country of 350 million, there will never be no racist incidents, ever. I'm sorry, it's a, it's just think of the math of it, right? One is roughly a third of a billion people. So if something has a one in a billion chance of having, happening to you on any given day, it will happen once every three days to someone somewhere. <coughs> and it could still be the case that that thing is extremely rare. So there are gonna be hate crimes. Hate crimes have been going down for decades. There are going to be racist incidents <coughs> in, many, in many directions. And we cannot measure uh, um, we cannot make the benchmark of progress a zero racism country. Patricia? Do you think that um, in the lack of the history of the power <coughs> dynamic that existed, we would still run into that issue where we could never reach that number of having no racist incidents? Or so, do you, I guess my question is, and I'm from India, so I mm. see it in a flip. I see mm. brown on white because my country was colonized for 200 years and there is some inherent biases against white people. Mm. Do you think that that power dynamic would, or that sort of feelings of animosity would still exist if, say, we hadn't been colonized for 200 years? 
the feeling of animosity towards whites or Europeans. In the Indian context, I'm not sure. Well, I, don't, I don't, don't know enough about that. Right, but <coughs> back to America, um, I think, I think uh, history has probably shown that even in the absence of brutal systems of racial oppression, it's, it's still often the case that tribalism, the kind of boilerplate human psychology, our tribal nature sometimes can be enough to get racial resentment off the ground. Um, but obviously our history has made it far more uh, resentment of, of blacks towards whites and whites towards blacks has made it far more, far worse and far more durable. I'm not really at bay to make any like determinations about, you cited uh, the Virginia, I think you did, the Virginia governor. Um, mm -hmm. And he was, a picture of him from about 40 years ago was, um, was released to the, the media and um, it portrayed him as wearing blackface. Uh, and then came out later that the Attorney General of Virginia also uh, came out and said he wore blackface to a party. Um, uh, I'm not at bay to say whether or not they should resign, uh -huh. but I find it interesting that all of a sudden all these instances of, um, of racism in the past, uh, while um, back then, those individuals may not have viewed their behavior as racist. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, uh, uh, the, the media has generated so much attention surrounding these incidents mm -hmm. that they feel that they're, um, they feel obviously it, they'd be noteworthy and you know, stories for the, me the public to consume. But my question is, do you think that <coughs> I, pretty much can guess your answer, but is there any way, manner in which these sorts of, this sort of behavior can be redressed? Um, like the blackface, for instance, you mean? I mean, um, do you, should these official, I know you don't want to be political, but is, there, no, no. is resign, resignation an adequate response, an adequate equal response? Um, one point I would make is that, I believe Washington Post did a poll, found that a higher percentage of white Virginians than black Virginians wanted Northam to resign. Um, <clears throat> that's obviously for partisan reasons, I would argue, because whites are skewing Republican. They just, it's not as if all of a sudden they care about blackface, right? They just want to get the guy out. <clears throat> but, but significantly more than, than blacks, right? As, um, uh, second point I'll make is that the, the blackface controversy, it's, it's a it's a very clear example of the, def, uh, of the difference between an the anti-racist vision and the humanist vision. The anti-racist vision has this history of minstrelsy, where white people would dress up as caricatures of black people, um, oftentimes kind of taking jobs from aspiring black actors and do sometimes loving portrayals, but oftentimes really ugly and racist portrayals. And um, that is the reason in the anti-racist vision, because racism, you, you can't know what, what racism means without examining the history of a country. And that history was associated with racism. Therefore, blackface is forever racist. Um, <coughs> and many people wouldn't articulate it necessarily that way. They, they would just say at a gut level, blackface, it's wrong. Don't like it. Uh, but they're unwittingly holding the anti-racist anti vision. The humanist vision, for example, I mentioned Bayard Rustin, Martin Luther King's strategist and the chief organizer of the March on Washington in 1963. Uh, in the early 1950s, he wrote that uh, obviously blackface and minstrelsy was associated with uh, white supremacy. It was one of the many reasons why black people had low self-esteem in this country. And yet, he said, obviously, it was obvious to him that at some point we would get to the point where we're humans. I can, you know, if I'm a comedian, if I'm the Waynes brothers, I can, I can dress up as, as white people and paint my face if I'm, um, a, and vice versa, right? It would just be, we're a human family. So that was, that was obvious to him in 1950 um, as someone who got arrested two dozen times for, for activism. Someone, in other words, who understood racism, 
but it was he, he it's a classic example of the humanist vision. Uh, and then the last thing I would say about blackface is um, it really sucks to be a politician at a moment like that. If, if you were an entertainer, for some reason, we don't care. We don't care that Jimmy Fallon did a actually somewhat, um, uh, let's say, rub me the wrong way. He did an impression of Karl Malone in the early 2000s that was actually uh, in poor taste, I, I would argue. Um, uh, sorry, that was Jimmy Kimmel. Did I say Fallon or Kimmel? Uh, but <laughs> Kimmel also, Fallon rather, also did blackface. Uh, Sarah Silverman, Fred Armisen did Honeyface to dress up as Obama. Uh, Robert Downey Jr., Tropic Thunder. Um, Ashton Kutcher, dressed up as an Indian man, as just like a, a stereotypical Indian man for a commercial. We're not calling for all these people, people's heads. Frank Zappa, Joni Mitchell, if you like their music, I'm sorry, <laughs> they're canceled. So we have a different standard for politicians and musicians. Perhaps it's because politicians don't make us happy or bring us any joy, but comedians and musicians do, so we keep two sets of books, and it's worth reflecting on why that is. So would you say that calling for them to resign in the first place, or any, is, is that, is redressal, no, that's not a word, is, um, <coughs> is that sort of response from someone in office who is obviously, um, at least in Herring's case, not Northam, because he now denies that he, that he did Well, Northam it. might also have been in the KKK costume, which I think is different. Different, yeah. It's different. Yeah. Um, although, <laughs> although he came out, yeah. Well, I meant, um, and I like it, but Northam did say he was in Michael Jackson. Yes. Uh, <laughs> blackface. And then almost moonwalked. Um, <laughs> but they are expressing remorse and saying that they understand the hurt that it caused. Mm -hmm. What is the um, the balance, if there is any? I mean, I think I think we are partially training people to be hurt, right. and I'm not saying that that hurt is not real. Um, offense is a real phenomenon. When I take offense to something, I feel it in my gut and I dislike it. At the same time, you can be educated into offense about a given issue. And it's not as if there's a set amount of offense taking in the black community or in any community for that matter. It flows over time and it is a direct consequence of the power of ideas. Um, you could persuade people in, in the grand sweep of history to be offended by all kinds of things and you can persuade them in reverse to not be, not be offended by those things. So uh, blackface is not inherently offensive um, and I think the implicit acknowledgement of that fact is that we're all losing no sleep over Sarah Silverman and Jimmy Fallon and Jimmy Kimmel. Virginians are losing no sleep over those people. So, you know, I, I suppose it's up for Northam to decide what, what he does, but I would personally feel under no obligation to resign in, if I were in his position. They can vote him out in what, two years? They'll vote him out or, or not. That will be the referendum. Um, at what point does the act of taking offense itself become the offense and more offensive? If there, if there is such a thing. If we're perturbed, then we're less of um, a positive influence on the people around us. And so I feel like, generally speaking, as you mentioned, there, there, there's the possibility that people are being educated toward taking offense. Mm. Um, I see that as huge danger um, because then we're, then, then, then to be, the most educated, you have to take the most offense. And now then we created a culture where everybody's taking offense to everything all the time. Mm. How can we move forward? Um, I, I, I'm likewise a humanist. I think that the, the way to get there is absolutely together. And we live, I guess, in the most polarized time. Um, you know, I, it's been almost two decades since I was you know, uh, in school and your guys' age. And I'm, I'm scared. You know, I'm, I'm scared that we're we're, we're definitely polarizing in a direction that's not going to get us where we all want to be. So I guess my, you know, um, again, my question would be, where's the line? Um, um, I mean, I, yeah, I, we're, de we're definitely polarized, but um, it's probably not as bad as it was in the late 60s, which well, sure. I, I suppose we can, <laughs> that's a, a scary benchmark to be compa comparing ourselves against, but um, uh, where's the line? 
I mean, the, the, the line for me as, as a humanist is the difference between reason and racism. Uh, you know, like, uh, we, we should all admit that we, c uh, you know, if, if, if we were to broadcast our thoughts over the radio for 24 hours, as, as the comedian Bill Burr once said, if we did that on Friday, we'd all be, all be out of a job on Monday. But what you believe upon reflection, how you treat people, um, not in the first millisecond of interaction, but, you know, as the seconds and minutes unfold, is, uh, in my view, who you are. And it's that, that aspect of a person that we should be judging. Um, not whether they dressed up in, in blackface in a particular context 40 years ago, that none of us are really privy to the what meaning. I mean, have you ever had like an inside joke with your friends? I'm assuming you're all normal human beings like I am, so. <laughs> Like, I, I can guarantee you, if, if I heard the inside jokes I was making with my friends at 17, I probably don't even remember where they came from or, or what they meant, um, let alone you know, the mass media now having a window into my history. Um, so the line should be intentions and beliefs. The, those beliefs matter. It's not just, obviously impact matters too, but it's not all about impact. So how do we how do we raise the level of discourse? How how can I help raise the level? Million of dollar question. <laughs> Thank you. I, I would just like to return to affirmative action and sure. thank you for being here. I actually only discovered you yesterday when I watched the Ruben interview, okay. and I love a lot of what you have to say. Oh, thank you. Uh, one thing that got me really excited is when you mentioned us Asians in the race and American question. Mm. A group of people I think is rarely mentioned, mm. but to me, affirmative action is not just about college; it's about society as a whole. I think American society feels that because for some reason um, it tends to be that black Americans, Latinos, and other minorities deserve more help in a sense, or deserve benefits that we don't receive, even though as a Chinese person I can speak to the fact there's been the Chinese Exclusion Act, there's been the Chinese lynchings of 17 and 20 Chinese people in San Francisco in 1871, yep. on top of the internment issue. So there, we faced discrimination in the past, mm -hmm. but now we've come to Point where we're sort of considered the model minority or the highest socioeconomic minority, in fact, even exceeding a lot of white Americans yeah. when you look at race as a whole and not ethnicity. Right. Uh, so I think my question is, I think you're with me in the sense that I don't think affirmative action is a solution and some, some of the anti-racist ideology that just because the race of some person, they deserve an easier form of access to a company or a college. Um, my question is sort of, What's your view on affirmative action? Just so you could elaborate more on it. Mm -hmm. And I think, sorry, this is really long, but I don't know. <laughs> but um, I think with affirmative action, institutions are trying to level the playing field, trying to help people who have historically been at a disadvantage. What do you think is the proper replacement for affirmative action? And I think when watching the Rubin report, you mentioned in fact the comparison of West Indian families and black families. People that a lot of people from the outside can't tell a difference of, but now in fact, have a great difference in social economic yeah. uh, status. So, yeah. yeah, I think, do you get what I'm trying to get? Yeah, yeah, I get, I get the gist for sure, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good, very good question. I think the idea of leveling the playing field <coughs> for different, that, that, that only makes sense if you view groups as units. In, in practice, affirmative action benefits people like me who did not need it, uh, who grew up solidly middle class uh, with strong parents who emphasized education. You know, I, um, affirmative action for the most part doesn't really help those black people on the bottom of society. Um, in practice, this has been true for the whole tenure of the policy. It's, it's much, uh, wh whenever there's a policy of some kind of dispensation, it's usually the people with the most power to access it that take advantage of it. So, for example, uh, like, like, many, like you mentioned, many I immigrant groups, West Indians, uh, Nigerians, Ghanaians, uh, um, African and West Indians make up, depending on the study, anywhere from 40% to two-thirds of kids at elite institutions. 
uh, Ivy Leagues, even though they make up 10% of the total U.S. black population. Uh, because like many immigrant groups, there's uh, selection variables, uh, there are different cultural factors that make them more successful. Um, these are people who have no, no grievances against America, historically speaking. We're not here for slavery, we're not here for Jim Crow, at least for the most part. Um, so the idea is we're leveling the playing field by giving a leg up to people who did not suffer from historical racism in America. And part of what that, what that entails is not only discriminating against um, wealthy Asian Americans who don't need the help, so to speak, but also discriminating against low-income Asian Americans who, at minimum, should get a level playing field themselves. The last thing I'll say about that is that it's not at all obvious, uh, nor is it at all borne out by the data, that you can correct for a, for a lack of development in someone from 0 to 18 by, at age 18, shuttling them into a college that they're frankly not prepared for based on test scores alone. It is not at all obvious that, that, that that's the case. Um, I think pr probably most of us anecdotally and in our social lives will know that mo you know, much of what can be done for you can be done from 0 to 18. And uh, much of the policy that could correct, could mitigate some of these disparities or just make society better for those on the bottom, so to speak, would be interventions at the early stage. Public education, charter schools, et cetera. So you make, you make this sort of distinction between um, African American and sort of um, West Indies, people who come from the West Indies and sort of other um, black um, cultural groups who have come in and sort of, I, don't, the, the, I, I think the argument that you, you drive at is sort of like a cultural difference in emphasis on education. I, mean, I do agree with some excellent, but here's some pushback on that point. With regards to how um, people who come into America sort of are selected, it's, there tends to be a more stringent process of immigration. There tends to be a more stringent immigration process which tends to select more higher skilled and higher, higher qualified people who are then bound to, of course, become more wealthy mm -hmm. in that regard than the typical African American population. So what would be your um, counter to that point of this sort of making that? Sure. Yeah. yeah. This is an uh, Im immigration selection effect, which is uh, real. I mean, obviously, it's not as if immigrants are plucked randomly from a country and end up here. They, there are patterns as to who comes. And um, I mean, the, the, the counter argument there would be, uh, why is it the case that there are such huge uh, disparities between different ethnicities of black immigrants, Haitians, Jamaicans, Nigerians, Ghanaians? Um, <coughs> you know, those, those selection effects presumably run the gamut of all those groups. I'm sure there are differences in terms of who's coming. Um, but you have, you know, you have black immigrant groups that make far less than the national average. You have black immigrant groups uh, you know, like Nigerians who make slightly more than, than the national average. Um, and you know, there, there's a story to tell, a very complex story to tell about why that is. It's not just culture, but culture matters. Um, it's immigration selection effects, geography, where do you live, right? Like income in New York is not the same as income in, you know, uh, in, in rural places because a dollar goes a much longer way in terms of standard of living. So there's a very complex story to tell here. The basic picture, however, is that uh, disparity is the norm both within races and between races. If we haven't gotten to disparity even within white people, like what, what possesses people to believe that we should be seeing equal outcomes between blacks and whites, groups that have completely different histories, completely different legacies? Um, it, it, th this is never, this, is all, this, is, this tends to be assumed but never, never argued for. If, if one's goal is to try and form like the most full conception of racism, <coughs> do 
you think that there's any merit to some of the anti-racist philosophies? I guess in your view, you talked a lot about um, reparations as like a policy that is irrational and wouldn't benefit anyone. But do you think that the type of philosophy, something like analyzing race as being based in historical racial power divisions, like you said, and putting positive like meaning to race, do you think that that's worth something in trying to like form a sociological or maybe just philosophical conception of race? Or do you think that humanism like as an idea is full? I can elaborate on that. I think I understand what you're saying. What I would say is that neither the humanist vision nor the anti-racist vision is obviously true um, <clears throat> or obviously false. There are different conceptual schemes uh, to layer onto reality. I, I, most of my analysis of the two visions is not in terms of, let me put it this way, m most of my analysis of the vision is in terms of their consequences for society. There are two different conceptual schemes. They're fundamentally opposed, irreconcilable and they have fundamentally different principles that therefore lead to fundamentally different outcomes for the societies that are ruled by them. Uh, and it's enough for me to say that the consequences of the humanist vision are far better than the consequences of the anti-racist vision to make the case. Does that answer your question? Yes, that, that makes sense. Just a brief follow-up. Sure. I'm sure you get countless questions <coughs> about systemic racism in America. You talked about um, briefly, New Jim Crow, talk about police brutality. And I'm not, I'm sure I'm not as educated on those issues as you are. But just in general, like the idea of the reason that people bring up those topics, mm. I guess, is that they're trying to maybe put evidence towards one viewpoint or another. Mm -hmm. So I guess with regard to that, is there, for a person trying to form a vision or a person like who has an experience in America regarding race, as, as they're forming their own viewpoint, is there, how are they going to come to their experience? So I, I can like set an example, like, like if you're growing up in somewhere like Ferguson where there were recent protests, now obviously there are a million different views on that, but mm -hmm. one viewpoint was that that was a situation, that was a location in which there was systemic racism. Mm -hmm. So people from Ferguson, maybe, I don't know, would have adopted an anti-racist vision in that race had consistent meaning for them mm -hmm. like in their life. Mm -hmm. So I guess like, it make to makes total sense what you're saying, they're just two different visions which have their consequences. But like I guess how do people come to that? How, do they, how are people coming to their own vision? Of yeah, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, many people do come to their um, vision via human ex lived experience. Um, I would point out an asymmetry here though, uh, which is I think uh, the typical peer of mine at Columbia, if I were to say, uh, if I were to make these arguments, they might say, well, w yeah, what do you say to the guy in Ferguson who actually has experienced uh, uh, um, unjust treatment by police being pulled over for no reason? There are such examples. Um, are you going to tell him he's wrong? Are you going to human PowerPoint this and just show a bunch of data and say, um, <coughs> you're wrong because, well, <coughs> I, I would point out an asymmetry there. A, whenever someone is saying something you disagree with and coming from lived experience, then their experience is just a single data point that doesn't um, uh, prove any larger point. But often when it's someone that agrees with what you're saying and they come from lived experience, then it's indicative of a larger trend. <coughs> it's proof of something. So for example, uh, there are countless white people in this country. One uh, who, uh, Scott Adams, the creator of the Dilbert cartoons, wrote in his, his memoirs that twice, two different times, he's been passed over for a job and the boss explicitly told him, Scott, we love you. We love you to death. We'd love to hire you. But <coughs> we got a lot of pressure to increase diversity here. And we're going to go for the slightly less qualified uh, black or Hispanic person. Uh, another Thaddeus Russell podcast host, <coughs> very interesting person. It's happened to him twice in his life. Uh, there, there was just a, a story, I think, in the, in the Independent, the UK. I think it was the UK. Could have this wrong. Um, <coughs> about a fire uh, um, fire department that actually officially instituted a rule whereby if you were black or Hispanic, you could get a 60% on 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 uh, the exam. 
and be admitted on the written exam, where if, if you were white, you had to get a 70%. And 70% had been the neutral bar for, uh, for a very long time. Uh, if one of those white people were to come to you and say, well, I have this lived experience of being discriminated against because I'm white, <coughs> many people would just laugh that out, out of the room. White tears, white fragility, Crimea River, world's smallest violin. Um, but it's the same. I mean, it, it's not, not, not necessarily the same magnitude, but it's the same structure, which is you've had an experience you feel is unjust from your point of view. It is unjust, I would argue. Um, but does that prove that white people are, that there's a pervasive system? Not, not by itself, no, that's, it's just an anecdote. Um, so my name is Dave. It's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, my yeah. friend Tim and I drove out from Allentown. Uh, oh, wow. I saw you on with or listened to you on Sam Harris and on the Thank Rubin Memorial. I think you're fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, we were really excited to come see you in person. Dave Rubin and he, and he discussed with you about the taboos that you're breaking. You talked about Kanye West and how he came at it with kind of a hammer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, um, <coughs> I guess I'd like to know what your experience at Columbia has been like since, uh, since your famous sort of I'm not famous. To <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, so the, the Shia LaBeouf, I'm not famous. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, 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 I don't get stopped at Columbia. Nobody. Uh, there's a couple people who know who I am, but it's so not, it's not a thing. No. All right, I'm not so far. Thing. <laughs> Thank God, because I, well, that's what I was wondering. Is because you know? I was figuring at Columbia, life could become brutal if it became. Uh, nothing. Nothing bad has happened. Uh, I might be like the the man who jumps off a building and. 10-story building and at the ninth floor says, well, so far so good. Oh, yeah. But I don't know. I don't know. Well, that's good. Could be well, perfectly fine. Right. I was hoping that things hadn't become a nightmare. I don't know. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say is I think that Martin Luther King would be mortified <coughs> right now. Um, you, you discussed on, it was either Sam Harris or, or with David Rubin, um, the number one homicide or the number one cause of death for for blacks is homicide. Young, young black men, and yes, yet for young black. young black men, yeah. right? Yeah. And the New York Times is focusing on microaggressions. Um, well, promoting uh, people like 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 Sarah Jong. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and deflecting from the real issues that need to be addressed. Right. Yeah. And I, I want to know in person what your take on that is. No. Um, <clears throat> yeah. The, the point I try to make there, and which I try to make often, is that. Uh, according to the CDC, uh, the, the latest number I, I know is from 2014, homicide is the leading cause of preventable death for black men aged 15 to 34. Um, it's not the leading cause of preventable death for any other uh, ethnicity. Right. That, that's not, it, it's, it's, it's normal historically to have disparities in terms of, I mean, the, the Irish used to commit homicide as, at three times the rate of, of the Germans. Right? It's, there are many reasons for this. Uh, but you will not hear the New York Times mention this fact because it seems to traffic in stereotypes about black criminality that I think we all rightly oppose, right? The question is what, what is the cost of not talking about? Are we so, um, should we be so shackled by our fear of resurgent white supremacy that we can't talk about the leading cause of death among among Right, you talked about the, the rule of the law of diminishing returns, <coughs> and that you're never going to bring down, you know, the murder rate to zero. The cost of doing that would be <coughs> far worse than, than, right. the actu than actually achieving a murder rate of zero. Correct. So yeah. in, in that vein, do you think that the cost of not attacking, say there's a stigma to, to talk about the real causal issues because of, of worrying about of, stereotypes that might come out that you don't want being heard. Mm -hmm. Is the cost of not addressing those things far worse than being afraid of offending people? Uh, in my view, yes. I yeah. mean, I, we're talking about a, uh, a death toll, a literal death toll. Uh, e every single year, far, about twice as many black people are killed as ever died, as were ever lynched in the history of this country, right? 4,000 would be the latter, roughly, uh, roughly 8,000. The former, uh, and yet, if you if you read the New York Times often, as I do, every few months you will see another article reminding us about the history of lynching. Right. Right. Lynching was terrible. It is awful. Right. Do we need? To, do, why? Why though is the focus on that? And you will never hear a peep about the murder rate. Uh, <laughs> 
million dollar question. And by the way, this is uh, Martin Luther King talked about the problem of crime multiple times. Okay, um, you're gonna call him a racist? I don't think so. So uh, it's a problem for sure. Thank you. Um, so actually, I want to see if I can tie up some of the things in here because I like what you were saying and I like what you were saying. I'm not sure if you're aware of a book. Perhaps you are, you seem to be aware of everything. Um, <laughs> written by Amy Chua called The Tiger Mother. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So uh, that, was, that was really well, you know, caused quite a stir. But in that, she makes it very, very clear why Asians do better. And what you've mentioned in some of your talks before, and what Thomas Sowell has, has talked about, is the, the culture among um, black Americans, which is different than in Africa, that to be educated, to do well, mm. uh, is to be considered white. Mm. So there's actually an investment in the culture not to do well. Mm. So this, this I, I feel that when uh, you're talking about like what the New York Times is deliberately not addressing the diversity of, of um, the, the, the Opinion, the, the black opinion, and you said the 51% and the 60%, mm. uh, they don't feel, and, and you're talking about that they're talking about microaggressions. It seems to me, when we look at history, that deliberately attempting to redress the crimes by imposing it on a people, like was done after World War I, led to World War II. So when you're mm. deliberately, like, uh, engineering a conversation to gin people up and get them really riled up and say, hey, you need to be redressed for this. Well, where do we draw the line? Do we draw it at women? Do we draw it at Mexicans? Or do we draw it at every minority except for, for whites? And as you point out too, there are there's a disparity among whites. So when you're doing that, you're really just, the intention to me seems like to uh, divide the people so united we stand, divided we fall, and it seems like when it's universally the case that the, that the media pushes this message, pushes this message, so that it breaks down conversation so that the whole education is to, to get us to uh, disagree with each other and educate us, as you pointed out, towards um, offense, to taking offense, that the whole agenda is really to break down the conversation so that we'll fight with each other and destroy our culture. Can you say something about that, please? Um, about the last statement, I will say uh, learning more and more about the anti-racist vision has given me at minimum, <clears throat> well, let me put it this way. I think it's always better to assume that your enemies are coming from a good place, your intellectual enemies. Right? I don't conceive of people with the anti-racist vision as my enemies. Uh, too many of my friends have that vision for, for, uh, for me to say that. But I think it's uh, just as a practice, I think uh, the economist Tyler Cowen has a great quote. If you want to increase your IQ by uh, overnight, just follow the simple, simple rule of assuming people who disagree with you are not evil. Or I'm not saying that's necessarily what you're saying, but um, is there goal to fracture society or is, is that the effect? I would, I would argue the latter. The latter is enough. It doesn't have to, I, frankly, I don't care if it's, if it's the goal. Um, uh, with regard to what you initially commented on, the, the acting white phenomenon, uh, I, I guess it's a sign of things that have changed just in the past few years that uh, Harvard professor Hen Henry Louis Gates published an op-ed in like the mid-2000s in the New York Times where he called out this phenomenon very specifically, the, this, the phenomenon being black kids, uh, middle school, high school age, uh, even younger potentially, uh, accusing each other of acting white or being a coconut. Um, if they speak in a certain way, someone like I do, um, if they're more Carlton Banks than Will Smith, so to speak. Um, uh, the problem is Carlton Banks probably ended up doing much better. Uh, in terms of socioeconomics. But th this is something that's been pointed out by Barack Obama, by Michelle Obama, by Jay-Z, um, Henry Louis Gates, um, even Chance the Rapper, even uh, in one of his songs, uh, says something about it. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's this kind of thing that if you bring up, you're blaming the victim. 
Uh, blame really has nothing to do with it, in my view. It's a matter of co the consequences of beliefs. Um, and as you said, we know from, you know, the Brookings Institution did a study that fo found that median Asian American student studies, spends twice as long studying as the median white student who spends longer studying than the median black student. Um, why, I mean, again, why, why would groups that have completely different histories be identical replicas of each other in terms of values, beliefs? Right? Like, like this, this makes no sense. This has never been true anywhere. Um, but it's taboo to point out. I think the, the Harvard sociologist Ad, Ad, uh, Orlando Patterson, who's done great work on the issue of culture as a cause in itself, uh, he said he sometimes refers to it as the C word because it, it is treated like that. Uh, you brought up the idea of reparations, and, and I think all of us have heard this idea where, um, and Jordan Peterson has said this, like, uh, in, in the talk of, um, when he was called an angry white man. Um, and, and the whole thing is, what is that idea? So, like, they just throw it out there in terms of, like, um, some I, some abstract idea, but is it like concretely framed? Reparations? Yeah, yeah. Because the, the, I feel like it's almost like a gateway drug. Because as soon as you do that for one group, you're going to have an endless um, line of people saying, "Well, what about us? You know, how long have women been oppressed? And and you know, how long have Mexicans been oppressed?" Mm. Um, and, and how far back in history do you go to establish the beginning point, and when does it end? Because if you give people money now, what about their children? Yeah. What, where um, do you start and end this thing? And, and perhaps it's the intention in doing that is, like I say again, specifically to, to create chaos and pull the whole thing apart. And why I think that I would say that the, the chaotic thing, I'm not as generous as, as you are, is because when you hear Jordan Peterson get interviewed, every, almost every single one has the same questions that are deliberately meant to provoke a response that, I mean, he's answered the same things hundreds of times. You can't even believe that the interviewers haven't even listened. You know they have. That's their job. Well, no, I, I feel like they're probably prepped by their interns five minutes before. <laughs> um, but, um, so the question is about the nature of reparations, mainly. Um, I think, in practice, successful instances of reparations, Jews in the Holocaust, Japanese Americans and uh, the internment camps, have been extensions of the principle of our nor normal legal system, which is that you specifically suffered, you get the payment. That, that coincides with our um, idea of, oh, what would you call it, uh, um, liability and, and I don't know what the legal term is, but it's, it's um, coextensive with the, the, the way our justice system works in general. And there's a good reason it works that way, because when you try to give justice to abstract historical groups as if I have something in common with a slave in, you know, 1818, that we're the same, we're part of the, it, it's a way of speaking metaphorically, not literally, right? Um, again, ha, yeah, there's, there's a good reason our justice system is not set up to, to deal with group justice or abstract inter, in, intertemporal group justice. It's because that's a dead end. Or really, uh, it's the opposite of a dead end. It's a perpetual motion machine of grievance. And the last thing I'll say about that is I, I've gotten a few people who are generally fan, fans of my work saying things like, uh, well, honestly, I'd be for reparations once if that was the end of the conversation, if we could finally just, we did it and it's over. I, don't, I, I, I think that's very unrealistic because it's a basic economic principle that if you pay someone to do something, they'll do more of it, not less. So reparations in some sense, in effect, it's a kind of paying people to agitate for reparations. What makes you think it would only be once? And by the way, 
you, you cannot pay off people for the, for, for the harm incurred by slavery, right? Holocaust victims, they got payment, but they did not get restored. There's no, there's no amount of money that, that can restore that. So I, I guarantee you the day after reparations, if it happens, um, three quarters of black children, black children will still be in single parent homes. Uh, we'll still have the education gaps, the crime gaps, that still have most of the racial wealth gap. And there will still be journalists and intellectuals saying, in fact, not, not only am I not satisfied, I am pissed that you think you can pay us off with that small amount. How dare you? The moral enormity of slavery, a check, really? Um, John McWhorter said that um, the pendulum, um, at least in the realm of discourse on these issues, may be swinging a little bit more gently come 2019 and beyond. Do you agree with that? Ooh, I don't make predictions. That could be true. I would like that to be true. Well, let me qualify that. We, we, we don't hear much from ta now, for example. He well, I hear writing, he, he's writing a novel. He might be writing a novel. Supposedly. Like a graphic novel or something, but we'll, we'll um, I mean, um, <coughs> um, again, it could be. The, the evidence I've seen have, ha, has shown that there's been a swing to the left within the Democratic, Democratic Party on identity issues. It's now the case, for example, that uh, uh, white liberals are far more likely to think that discrimination holds black people back than black people are themselves. This is from a pupil. It's like a 19 percentage point gap, right? So. In some sense, white liberals have become more woke than black people. Um, perhaps that's been true for a while, but it, it seems like, I mean, I, I encourage you all to do this when, when you go home or right now on your phones. Look up Google Trends uh, searches for the word systemic racism. You find a flat line from 2004 when, when it starts counting flat, 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 flat until roughly 2014 and then shoop, which says to me that um, so, I mean, perhaps that's, it's kind of been like a five-year spurt uh, caused by, you know, s <coughs> the availability of, of videos of young black men, unarmed men, getting killed. Uh, social media, the way in which social media skews our sense of what's going on in the world. The way in which uh, the media doesn't report the higher number of white un un unarmed men that get killed because it, it probably gets fewer clicks. Everyone knows the name Michael Brown, but not the name Daniel Shaver. Uh, you know, point, point being, you know, I hope John is right, that that, that was just a kind of five-year spurt, and now we're turning a corner, but I don't, I try to n not make predictions because most are wrong. So back to the anti-racist and humanist viewpoint, one, one viewpoint of the anti-racist is the reparation <coughs> idea, and that if we view the blacks and whites as like scoreboards, the white will be here and the blacks will be here, and we should make them level. And with that, we need to take from the whites, give to the black, and level the fee. Excuse me. Um, and the resources are limited, so we need to take from somewhere to give to the other group. You said that it's, that's a dangerous way to go in because you don't know how to stop, and it's like a circular pattern, and it's dangerous. But one other viewpoint would be, how to say it? Uh, I lost my train of thought. It hurts less to take from the white and give for the black, because getting the, the black from the bottom up is more valued than taking someone who is privileged uh. down. Um, if that's the logic, why not take from the rich and give to the poor regardless of color? Could, wouldn't that even be, um, you're saying it's, it hurts less for the people losing money uh, than it feels good for those gaining it, right? So. And this idea is not just about money, it goes for affirmative action too. Okay. If you take from the white person, <coughs> you reject them from a college, they would certainly get to another, but for the black person that's that one opportunity for, to, to go to the road of success. 
Well, again, this is where our speaking in terms of black and white gets very misleading. We're talking, black people, we're talking about a group 40 million strong. Um, that includes me, my grandfather, and, uh, you know, somebody in a single parent home in Baltimore or south side of Chicago um, that is looking to the street for father figures, right? Very, very different. We have tax returns. You know, we have, we have the information of how much money people make roughly. You know, your logic would seem to, it would seem to work just much better to do it in terms of class rather than race if we were going to do, so, uh, by the way, this is what the welfare state is. We have a welfare state. It's not perfect. Uh, should be improved. But it hurts, you say it hurts less for white people to get something taken than, than the gain. The gains are greater for blacks than the pain is for whites. Well, the gains are much greater for the poor of all colors uh, than, than, the, uh, than the hurt is for the rich of all colors. So it, just se it seems like no reason not to, not to go for class in, instead of race on. So would you go for the class? <clears throat> well, in, pr in practice, we do. And I think it's a, yeah, I think, you know, it's not an accident that every mixed free market or mostly free market society on the planet has a welfare state. Um, it's because, you know, there are no libertarian utopias. The welfare state's not going away. I don't want it to. Um, which is not to say it can't be reformed, but uh, that's kind of a matter for economists to, to work out. Uh, referencing your welfare state, you know, you would know better than I what Thomas Sowell has to say about that and the evidence that he points to um, uh, where the introduction of that uh, after the civil rights movement really actually destroyed those people that they were trying to help or they claimed that they were trying to help mm -hmm. that actually historically the people that were most in favor of the raise of the minimum wage uh, were the Ku Klux Klan like oh yes give it to the blacks mm -hmm. uh, they were so delighted because they knew that economically it was clear as day if you did that you would destroy them and yeah. it's exactly what it did yeah yeah uh, that, so that is these true things that appear to be uh, beneficent on the surface actually are the reverse and it, it's that thing that I find so troubling about yeah. the media yeah um, I, I think it depends on y you cite a good example um, much the same could be said about historically at least about trade unions the vast majority of black leaders opposed trade unions because it was understood that they were a means of keeping black people out of work um, uh, Minimum wage is another good example. Welfare, mo mo many contemporary observers of the Great Society did find, and uh, my mother used to tell me this, having grown up, her having grown up in the South Bronx in the 60s and 70s, that it was well known when the welfare auditor came around that there couldn't be a man in the house or else you would lose the checks. You can understand how that might uh, incentivize single parent homes, which subsequently spiked. Doesn't mean. Uh, it's unclear to me whether the welfare state is the whole story behind the, um, behind the rise in single parent families because we saw the same rise in the white community a few decades later. So it may have just been a larger cultural phenomenon. And on the other hand, there are parts of our welfare state that are agreed upon on the left and right that work very well, like the earned income tax credit. So um, I would caution against, I guess, a totalizing story, but there are there are seriously seriously bad examples that don't get talked often don't don't get talked about often enough of of policies that are intended to uh, help blacks that that end up hurting. For sure, the book "Please Stop Helping Us" by Jason Riley is pretty good on this. With regards to discussion of culture and race in general in the United States, it, we're in a weird time in the United States in general. But it's, it's a, we're in a very, I don't know, acidic cultural moment. I mean, obviously, polarity and basically polarization, basically every category is as high as it's been since, as you were saying earlier, the 1960s. So how does that inform your viewpoints on race and more specifically on culture? Because it seems like there's such a focus on 
the reevaluation of like America's image, especially you know returning to populism, and in some ways it seems like wrote straight xenophobia. Mm -hmm. So it's, this isn't a specific question, but like we're not living in 2012. I guess it seems like that's a very long time ago. So mm -hmm. how does that inform your discussion, your viewpoint? I guess it just makes it more urgent to me. Um, I'm not sure I have a, an answer that's more specific than that. I think it's more urgent than ever to inject nuance into conversations on both sides of the political spectrum. Um, I, I, that's a cliche, but it's true. I don't know that I have more to say other than that. I guess just when you have a <coughs> plurality of the country that's primarily white, and on majority male, but not hugely. Oh, the voting for Trump, you mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't want to identify them. Uh, you could say Trump voters, but maybe a lot of them would have preferred someone else. So just mm -hmm. when you see this, I guess, this division in the United States, and a, a lot of times there's a, at least a cultural idea of frustration with identity politics, with a focus on identity, with skin color or gender or something like that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's troubling? I guess, I guess how, how do you respond to that, that anxiety that exists in America, which seems like there's this fear over identity politics, whether mm -hmm. it's a good thing or a bad thing? Mm -hmm. I mean, a humanist point of view would certainly say like, the idea of identity politics is not great, because yeah. we, should have, we should look at it in a more intellectually honest fashion. But at the same time, that can seem to overlap into language which is often, if not racist, what do you discriminatory. mean? Discriminatory. Do you have an example? I think Donald Trump's rhetoric is, and if you want to look for a specific example, I'm sure you could look at it, like sort of the growth of the alt-right is a group that seems to jump from hatred of identity politics into aggressive and discriminatory. Well, well the, the alt-right loves identity politics. They practice it. It's the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would argue. Um, I mean... Jews will not replace us. Right. It's interesting, uh, actually, reading some of the, uh, going back and reading some of the anti-racist thinkers from the 60s, they would sometimes say things like, um, you know, s integrating schools is a kind of painless genocide, right? There's no blood spilled, but you're killing black culture. Exactly the same thing that, uh, um, uh, Somebody in, in, in the, I think a, um, a member of parliament in the UK said uh, immigration from South Asia was a kind of, I think he said bloodless genocide. But the, the symmetry stood out to me. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that anti-racists are not racist. Uh, the, the, and I've talked about these two visions, the anti-racist versus the humanism. There's, of course, a third vision, namely the racist vision, which has ruled America for most of its history. And the humanist vision and the anti-racist vision are two different reactions to that. Um, and it's a mistake, I think. I think a mistake that people in the humanist tradition can sometimes make is to say the anti-racists are just the same as the racists. Uh, that's, that's, usually, that's generally not the case. There are some examples, uh, Louis Farrakhan, Elijah Muhammad. But in general, it's not true because Racists locate the meaning of race either in genetics or God. Um, Anti-racists locate the meaning of race in history. Those are, those are two different. They can sometimes sound the same as in the pain, painless genocide versus bloodless genocide example, but they are different. I can take maybe one more. I have to pee rather badly. <laughs> right now. Okay, so do one more? Yeah. Kanye no. West. <laughs> so, um, now I really, I, because when, in, on, I can't remember which podcast, but you did refer to the moment where he tweeted, um, I like the way Candace always th owns things, um, as sort of like a, um, a let, an open moment for you where you felt, com I don't know, confident enough to air your views on Colette and all that. So my, com my, my, my thoughts or with regards to Kanye West and sort of that entire um, 
flow is with regards to the idea of a vocal um, minority and sort of a more silent majority. And Kanye, throughout his rant, through, throughout that period up until August or September actually, kept on hammering on the point of the silence of a larger group. And I was interested in what you think about that sort of phenomena whereby there is or there may be a, a group that's pretty quiet or more silent that is that find that hasn't found its voice because for whatever reasons virtue signaling or whatever um, reasons do you think that it do you think that um, things like Kanye what co people like Kanye West or what things would move that my, that quite that silent majority if it is a majority. Mm to a more prominent light, or do you think that that stasis of sort of like a silence is bound to continue? It's a good question, and again, I don't make predictions. Um, but we, we know from, po I mean, virtually every poll of the opinions of black Democrats finds slightly more conservatives than liberals among black people. Keep in mind, these people are almost all voting Democrat. But they identify as conservatives at a slightly higher degree than they do as liberals, um, which is a minimum interesting. That's not necessarily something you would know if you just if you're just a passive consumer of media. So, is there a silent majority? Uh, I mean, I think there certainly is. I think it's a it's a majority that is not necessarily silent, uh, but is not really listened to or catered to. Uh, I was recently, <coughs> uh, it was recently pointed out to me that I think four years ago, their black families basically ran into the, basically like stampeded the NAACP in I think Ohio, basically because they wanted charter schools and Democrats and teachers unions in general, the teachers union are completely against charter schools, no matter how much massive demand there is. Wait lists, thousands of kids long, right, for these charter schools. And, um, you know, that's considered kind of a conservative issue for some reason. I'm not sure what it is about charter. Sometimes they're a little bit more disciplined. But the charter schools run the gamut. And it's like a perfectly, <coughs> sorry, perfectly valid um, hypothesis that charter schools some of which have been very successful, are better than public schools, or can be, for, for black, primarily serving low-income black and Hispanic families, it's branded as a conservative issue. Plenty of demand for the, that in the black community. You don't really find people other than Jason Riley at Wall Street Journal and a few others really <coughs> uh, making the case. Again, not for lack of demand. Uh, as to your question, what would change it? Uh, will Kanye help? I don't know. Seems like he's kind of dropped off the grid. Who knows what he's up to? He's uh, not totally there. And he also said that slavery was a choice. And he also said that slavery was a choice. Um, you know, I'm not sure that Kanye or Candace are the best articulators, the best spokesmen for the silent, uh, silent majority, if there is one. I don't know. I don't know how that problem gets fixed. Good. Right, no, I regret asking, not asking this if, if I don't. Um, <coughs> Thank you, Cliff. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, um, uh, going back to uh, systemic racism um, and, and education, uh, it seems to me, I mean, I, I've heard that there's like uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, kind of a shuffling uh, from inner city, um, predominantly black schools, to the prison <coughs> system, which is, of course, for profit in this country. <coughs> I wanted to know if, if you consider that systemic racism or not. I, 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 don't, I don't know, so that's why I'm asking. Um, the, the percentage of prisons that are private is very small. The, the percentage of our nation's inmates who are in private prisons is very small relative to those who are in state prisons okay. and federal prisons. Okay. Um, you could, I could snap my fingers and release everyone who's in a private prison, and we would still have the mass incarceration problem if, if we want to frame it that way. Okay. Um, do I consider incarceration, an example of systemic racism. Uh, I mentioned earlier that 
there's this example of systemic racism, what I consider to be a paradigm case of it, in the in the justice system with court stenographers. Right. Um, that made it harder for black defendants to get a fair shake uh, in the system. Um, from what I know, and again, I'm not a criminal justice policy expert, but uh, you know, I take from you know, John Pfaff, uh, who wrote a great book, um, what is it entitled? Um, Locked Up? Yeah, maybe. Does that sound right? Uh, he, he attributes most of the rise in incarceration to the perverse incentives facing prosecutors. Like we've just gotten news of K Kamala Harris's old, very tough on crime, uh, prosecutorial stance of uh, you know, making it illegal for parents not to send their kids to school, making truancy a crime. Mm -hmm. That was part of a whole incentive structure for prosecutors to go for the longest sentences possible, toughest crimes, or rather, uh, toughest sentences possible. Um, and it was really, it was a phenomenon, there it was no grand conspiracy. I mean, frankly, much of the push for law and order was coming from black communities. That's why uh, two thirds of the Congressional Black Caucus voted for the 1994 crime bill, right? Clear majority, and they were responding to demand in their, commu in their communities at a time when the crime rate was astronomically, as I put it in New York, nine times higher than it is today. It's easy to forget that, especially people my age who weren't alive to remember it. But um, uh, no, I don't, I mean, it, it's possible that there couldn't be some bias in the system. And at the same time, the vast majority of the increase can be due to uh, things that are not related to bias. Both can be true. Okay. Thanks again. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much.